Hey, I'm so glad that you're here today, and uh, we are starting a brand new series today. We're talking about family building blocks, and you know, every time after Easter, you hope that the message you share is going to want to have people come back and, and say, well, let's find out more about that church, and family is always a really good thing to talk about. So if you were here last week for the first time, welcome back. We're glad that you're here and uh, hope that this will be a time which is meaningful to you. And today we're going to be talking about the family building block, how to have a happy marriage. Now we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 20 through 22 through 33 today. If you'd like to turn to that, that's page 1823 in the Bible there in the chair near you. If you are married, you know that uh, marriage is such a special relationship. But you also know that marriage can be challenging at times as well, don't you? You know, I, some time ago, I, I heard that there was an ad that was placed in the local news source that said, wedding dress for sale, worn once by mistake. <laughs> yeah, that seems to be so true in our society, doesn't it? You know, we, we know that that is pretty common for the most part. Someone said one time that love is a dream, but marriage is the alarm clock. It's where you get woken up from that wonderful dream that you were in just then. You know, I read about this, uh, this guy who was from Waterbury, Connecticut. And as I was studying this, uh, getting ready for this message, I came across this story. He's going through a divorce and has gone through that. He's, and his wife were married for 62 years. And he found out, or she found out, that he was not actually deaf and mute like he'd been faking for 62 years. So he wouldn't have to listen to her. That's what it was, all right? According to the divorce papers, Barry Dawson, 84 years old, never spoke a single word in front of his wife the whole time they were ever together. And Dorothy was learning sign language. It took her two years to really feel like she got fluent at sign language. And then his eyesight began to go, he said. You know, so she thinks he's probably faking that also. So I can't see what you're saying to me. Now, they did manage to have six children and 13 grandchildren, all of them who were convinced that their grandfather couldn't speak and was deaf. One of the daughters said, when he was at home, he was always faking being deaf. It wasn't until I watched a YouTube video of him singing in a karaoke bar when he was supposed to be at a meeting for a charity. That's when I understood everything. Now, Mr. Dawson's lawyer uh, kind of tried to put another spin on this. He said that the elderly man's stratagem wasn't meant to offend or cheat his spouse. It may have, in fact, been what helped the marriage to last for 62 years. He said, my client is pretty quiet and not very talkative, but his wife is annoyingly chatty. If he hadn't faked being deaf, they'd have been divorced 60 years ago. In a way, he did it for her and for their family. <laughs> That's an interesting way to look at it. But let me tell you what. If you want to make your marriage last for 62 years, do not fake being deaf or mute and being unable to communicate with your spouse. That wouldn't work. You know, if you went to Barnes & Noble or tomorrow, let's say you went to Lifeway Christian Bookstore, you would find whole sections that talk about marital relationships. You would find those sections in kind of like the how-to or the self-help sections of those areas, talking about family. And you would see those and you would say, wow, man, there's a lot of people out there who really need to read this information, really need to hear this information, because every marriage, no matter how good it is, has ebbs and flows to it, doesn't it? It has highs and lows to it. That's kind of part of, of what life is about. And there are a lot of books that would tell you how to address certain things in your marriage. But today I want to address it uh, from the, the very best book of all, the, the book that God has inspired, the Bible. And in that we find the ultimate blueprint for marriage. We find the descriptions of, of what God's perspective is about marriage and how we can make our marriages healthier and happier. Now in the Bible, it tells us that God is the one who actually established marriage. He gave Eve to be the wife of Adam. It tells us that after their exchange, after the time that they first got together, we find that, uh, that there were certain things that, that Adam felt about the relationship. For example, when God was ready to design Eve, he planned it so that she would be a helper or a blessing to Adam. She was also going to take away the loneliness that he felt. He was the only human being on planet Earth at that time. He'd had the responsibility of naming all of the animals. And when he was naming all the animals, it tells us in Scripture that he saw male and female of those animals, but never did experience having a female of his own. 
So God was going to address the loneliness that Adam was feeling. And he also was going to form Eve out of Adam's body. It was going to be different than how God had formed Adam out of the dust. He caused Adam to go into a deep sleep. He performed a surgery on him, taking a rib from his side. And from that experience, then, he was able to make Eve. And when Adam woke up and saw her, he was very impressed with the way she looked, obviously. But then he said, she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And that was literally true. She truly was. Now, they were told to be fruitful and to multiply, to work together, and that they were truly gifts from God to each other. And, and then Moses, in describing this later on, in that same chapter of, of the creation there of Eve, we find that Moses addresses marriage in that. And Moses, in writing this, says, Therefore a man will leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they'll become one flesh. Later on in the New Testament, Jesus and Paul both affirmed those same words. And what we find happening here is that God is saying that marriage has some initial key components to it. The very first one is leaving. You know, married couples will, will not excel if they start off their marriage living at home, okay? Uh, there's a reason why Moses writes, leave home. You need the opportunity, if you are just married, to be able to establish yourself. You need to be able to spend that intimate time together, building your relationship. If you are living at home, you're not so much husband, as wife, husband and wife as much as you are married children living with parents. You need the opportunity to establish yourselves. So leaving is the first step. God is saying, get away, get your own place, establish yourselves as a standalone couple. And then there is the word cleaving. So we leave and then we cleave. And when Moses writes about cleaving, he is using a Hebrew word here, which indicates being glued together. So when something is glued together, it is turned into one, isn't it? It's taking two pieces, putting them together, making them one. If you've ever built a cabinet or some other kind of uh, material or some other kind of uh, thing where you're going to take two pieces of wood, put them together, you'll find that oftentimes the boards that you get are not as wide as the cabinets that you're going to make. And so you have to take two pieces and glue them together. You put like some Elmer's wood glue in there and, and you put some clamps on that and you clamp that so that it has the ability to, to adhere one side to the other. Then you make sure you wipe off, the, wipe off the excess glue and then the next day you come back and you've got two pieces of wood that have been turned into one piece of wood. And those pieces where that seam is are often stronger there than they are in other parts of that wood plank. And so we find that that's the idea that Moses is getting at right here. When two people come together, they are cleaving together. This isn't holding each other tight on a moonlit night. This is turning into a permanent couple right here. This is a Mr. and Mrs. This is a household. And so the idea behind this is leaving and cleaving are joining people together. When you cleave, you aren't stuck with each other. You are strengthened together. Okay, I want to make sure that that point is, is made because some people might say, yeah, Lee talked about sticking two pieces of wood together. They're just stuck together. So we're stuck together. No, nope, that isn't what I mean. You are strengthened together. You become one together. And then Moses says something about one flesh. And he's talking about that natural part of marriage, which is sexual, a sexual relationship between a husband and wife that they get shared together. It's interesting in the Old Testament times that God designated it that if a couple got married, that the husband had the opportunity to have an exemption from any service out away from home so he could spend time with his wife making her happy. Isn't that a great way of saying that? He gets to stay home. They get to enjoy each other. Now, at the end of the year, maybe she's ready for him to leave, but while they're there, his responsibility, it says, is to make his wife happy. That's referring to leaving, cleaving, and one flesh right there. Now, we all know that despite this plan that there are those ups and downs, there are those ebbs and flows in a relationship. And so God gives us other things in his word to help us to understand how to strengthen our relationship, how to, to get it to the point where we, we can surf through those ebbs and those flows, how we can, we can be made stronger in those times where we may feel weak, in fact. 
And so he's given us some marital building blocks to help us succeed. And if you're using your outline today, it's on the back of your bulletin. If you'll get that out, if you haven't already, you can fill in some blanks along the way. And uh, hopefully this will be helpful to you. The first one is, you are married to a wonderful sinner. You are married to a wonderful sinner. Now, you didn't expect me to say sinner there, did you? <laughs> but you know it's true, don't you? You are married to a wonderful sinner. Now, when I say that, I'm not talking about a bad person. I'm not talking about you're married to a bank robber or, or some syndicate boss or something. At least I don't think you are. But <laughs> what I'm getting at right here is that you are married to an imperfect person, somebody who makes mistakes, somebody who wants to live up to a certain standard and fails to do that, wants you to live up to a certain standard and, and knows that you don't do that. You're married to a person who makes mistakes, who sometimes willfully says hurtful things. And, and we know almost as soon as we get married that there are things that begin to irritate us. He leaves the toilet seat up. Now, that's an ancient one, right? She leaves the bathroom countertop a mess. He leaves his clothes on the floor instead of them putting them in the, the dirty clothes hamper. She carries everything but the kitchen sink and maybe the kitchen sink in her car, okay? We know that's true. There are other irritating things that happen. Not helping with the kids like we should. Spending too much time on our hobbies. Poor hygiene. Talking during television programs, especially during the Hallmark Channel. Being glued <laughs> to the cell phone or computer screen while not paying attention to other things. It's the truth, isn't it? We are married to people who have faults and who fall short of God's glory and our own ideas of what is ideal right here. Now, the other thing, though, I want to emphasize is even though I've got that word sinner in there, just before it is the word wonderful. Wonderful. You are married to a person who also has a wonderful side to them. You are married to somebody who might be irritating at times, but they are God's gift to you. You get to be with that person that you have cleaved to. And you know what? They talk about life giving the test before the lesson. You know, you've heard that phrase before, I'm sure. But sometimes marriage is the same way. Marriage sometimes gives the test before the lesson is given. And because of that, we have the opportunity to sharpen each other. We have the opportunity to make each other better, to mold each other's lives. And when you think about it, our marriage is often a reflection of what we are contributing to that relationship. I hear people say sometimes, I wish that my spouse would change. Now, I realize that none of you have ever said that before, but most of us have said and know people who have said, I wish that my wife or that my husband would change. We'd be in a happier relationship. But we would be in a happier relationship if we want that, we have to put ourselves into it to improve it. There's an old story about a, uh, a, a woman who was getting married. And uh, I performed a lot of weddings over the years in this building and, and other places. And I know that it's a time where nerves are really, really there. I mean, they're, they're big time at that point. And sometimes couples, when they're repeating their vows to each other, they're chuckling and they get them all turned around and they're afraid that the next day they're going to do the same thing. And there's a nervousness about that. And this one particular bride was especially nervous that she was not going to remember what she was supposed to do. And so after the, the time of, uh, of, of a ceremony, after the time of rehearsal, uh, the pastor got with her and said, listen, I know you're nervous. There are really only three things that you really have to remember. The first one is you got to walk up the aisle, okay? So that's pretty easy, right? Walk up the aisle. The second one is that you're going to be at the altar, okay? You're going to stand at the altar. And then the third thing you need to remember is you will be next to him, the guy that you are marrying. So all night long, she is hardly sleeping at all because she's got this going in her mind, those three things that he has told her. The next day, she's all decked out in her wedding dress and she's walking with her dad up the aisle. But people who are next to the aisle are hearing her repeating that. Aisle, altar, him I'll alter him and, and it's just like turning into I'll alter him you know what I'm saying <laughs> that, that's what a lot of people think when they're getting married right I'm going to alter that person we think we can change them once we get married and I want you to know that that is really not true very often at all if you get married chances are you're not going to be very successful if that's what you think is going to happen 
There was a panel of women one time who got together and they were debating and describing uh, the perfect guy. And they determined that the perfect guy was Mr. Potato Head. Okay? There were four reasons why Mr. Potato Head was the ideal guy, the perfect guy. Number one, he was tan. Number two, he was cute. Number three, he knew the importance of accessorizing. And number four, if he looks at another woman, you can rearrange his face. Okay? <laughs> That was the perfect guy, according to those ladies. But listen to this. In 2015, actor Will Smith was discussing his marriage to actress Jada Pinkett Smith. And he revealed that nearly 20 years together had sometimes been filled with ups and downs. He was talking to Entertainment Tonight. And he said, you can't expect it to be easy. It's like our marriage was the most difficult grueling excruciating thing that we have ever taken on in our lives and you know that we're just not quitters and then Smith who married Pinkett Smith in 1997 went on to say these words if there is a secret I would say is that we never went into working on our relationship now that sounds kind of odd right there but listen to how he followed that up he said we only worked on ourselves individually and then presented ourselves to one another better than we were previously pretty good advice isn't it working on ourselves making ourselves better and then presenting ourselves to our spouse I like that you know can I encourage you this morning to to have God work on your relationship and to work on you personally ask him to take you through the steps to become a better husband or a better wife and better than you are right now and if you ask him to do that he will do that he will help you. Secondly, uh, you will find happiness in serving each other. You'll find happiness in serving each other. When I counsel couples, oftentimes we talk about expectations that they bring into that relationship. And there are expectations like, uh, like where are we going to spend our first Thanksgiving? And one of them has one place in mind, the other one has another place in mind. How about our first Christmas? Are we going to go to your house or my house? Are we going to go somewhere else for Christmas? There are other kinds of expectations. Who's going to do the chores around the house? Who's going to take care of making sure that, that uh, other things are taken care of? Maybe the, the, the kids are, are taken care of. Who is who's going to um, be the person who is, is uh, involved the most in certain types of things around the house? Maybe handling the finances um, enough that they can still go out a couple times during the week. Someone might say, I want to have someone who will cook like my mom. Don't tell your spouse that you want someone to cook like your mom, okay? I want someone who will keep my clothes looking good. I want someone to make sure that I don't have to stop and, and get gas in my car. Someone who will do that for me. There are all kinds of expectations that people bring in to a relationship. But let me share with you that expecting to have all of your needs and expectations met is going to set you up for disappointment because you're going to be let down from time to time. The Pew Research Center reports that millennials are significantly less likely to be married than previous generations were in their 20s. But why is that? Because when they, when they began to talk with them, they found that more than half of the millennials surveyed by Pew characterized their own group as self-absorbed. San Diego State University psychologist Gene Twinge says, trying to live with somebody else and putting their needs first is more difficult when you've been raised to put your own self first. Isn't that true? But let me tell you what, that may be true of millennials, but it's not just true of millennials. It's been true over time. Paul addresses that in the scripture in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. He says this to husbands and wives. He says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. People sometimes enter into the marriage relationship or are in their marriage relationship and they are asking, what can they do for me? Or why aren't they meeting my needs? Why aren't they doing as I expected? Instead, it ought to be, this is a person that I love and I've married. How can I meet their needs? How can I lighten their load? How can I do something unexpected that will bring them joy? How can I affirm them? And we are to do that out of reverence for Jesus. You see, when Jesus is at the top of that pyramid and we are on the sides of that pyramid, we are saying our relationship is under his leadership, under his headship. 
And when we recognize that he is the Lord of our lives and the Lord of our marriage, it makes us submit to him and it makes it easier to submit to each other as well. Writer Heather Havrilski uh, talks about what true romance is. And in her, one of her writings, she says this. She says, after a decade of marriage, I'm going to tell you my most romantic story of all. I was very sick out of the blue with some form of dysentery. It hit overnight. I got up to go to the bathroom and I fainted on the way and cracked my ribs on the side of the bathtub. My husband discovered me there, passed out in a scene that, well, think about what that might look like. My husband was not happy about this scene, but he handled it without complaint. That is the very de definition of romantic. Not only not being made to feel bad about things that are clearly out of your control, but being quietly cared for by someone who can shut up and do what needs to be done under duress. Now, she says that's romantic, but then she continues on. She says, now let's tackle something even darker and even more unpleasant, the seeming antithesis of our modern notion of romance. And I can identify with this one because of how my dad was while my mom was passing away. She says, someone is dying in their own bed, and someone's spouse is sitting on the bedside, holding the dying person's hand, and also handling all kinds of unspeakable things all by themselves. To me, that's romance. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, and he said for them to do the same thing. You know, he talks about service as being an important thing. In fact, he says, the greatest among you will be the servant of all. Now, that's important, isn't it? That's significant. Now, he's not just talking to his disciples, though. He's also talking to his future followers in that regard. You know, marriage is the greatest human relationship that we can have. And in marriage, we ought to be thinking about how we can serve our spouse and meet their needs. Now, a third thing is your success will be enhanced by Scripture. Your success will be enhanced by Scripture. If you've ever watched The Family Feud on television, you know the deal. You know that there's a host, you know that there are two families lined up on one on either side, and you know that the audience has been surveyed before the show takes place, and they've been asked a series of questions. They give their answers. Someone who works there tallies up all of their answers and puts them on this kind of a tab page or tab, tab sign that's there in, in the program. And, and the thing is, is that, that there are there's a representative from each family who comes out. Steve Harvey, the host, is there. They have to hear a question, and boom, they have to hit this buzzer in time to be the first one to do that so that their family gets to play the game while the others watch. Now, that's the way it's set up. Now, we know that, that there are questions that are given, and, and, uh, and when Steve Harvey talks about it, he turns to the board and says, Survey says... And they bring up the answer on there. And if the answer they gave is not there, there's a big X that's right there, right? You know what I'm talking about. That's the way the show is run. Let's just kind of pretend for a moment that you and I are in the audience today for that show. And let's just pretend that they've asked us a question. And here's the question. What's the most important thing a husband and wife need from each other? What's the most important thing that a husband and wife need from each other. Now, chances are you would write something and I would write something. We might write several things on there for that matter. But you know what? Scripture, if we were to find an answer there, would give us something very significant and it would be exactly right. It would be the right answer. Now, the number of things that we might come up with, but the Apostle Paul, if he was being surveyed by a family feud, would say this from Ephesians 5. He would say that wives need love from their husbands. That shouldn't surprise us, right? But then he throws a curveball, and he says men need respect from their wives. In Ephesians 5, Paul lists three ways a man is supposed to love his wife. Listen to these. He says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. In other words, sacrificially. Secondly, love your wives as your own bodies. And then he says, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself. Now, guys, we're kind of dense. We need to hear that three times, right? We need to hear three different ways we're supposed to do that. But ladies, he, at the end of that section, then gives you what we need to hear. And we need it just as much as you need those three ways of love. He says, wives, respect your husbands. 
Now, do you know what that means? It means admire your husband. Let him know that you look up to him, that you think highly of him. That is what that word respect is right there. Sometimes people get the impression that a woman is supposed to be a doormat. That's not the case at all. She is supposed to admire her husband. Now, why would Paul talk about love for the lady and respect for the guy? You know why that is? Because he knows, because the Holy Spirit has inspired him to know that those are the greatest needs that you and I have have in our relationship we all need love no doubt about that but women need a certain type of love and men need that respect as well now I'll tell you what I don't know of any husband who doesn't want or need his wife's respect he needs to feel sincerely admired by her and she needs to feel sacrificially and devotedly loved by him those are scriptural things Several years ago, when Sherry and I were attending Lincoln Christian College in Lincoln, Illinois, there was a guy who was a president of the school. His name was Leon Apple. Man, you talk about a guy that was a great preacher and great leader at the school. Everyone admired him. And, and then one year, when he was during the summertime on vacation in Minnesota on a fishing trip, he died. A pretty young guy, for the most part, left behind his wife and, and kids there. And, and the whole college was devastated by his loss. Mrs. Apple, one time a few years later, was addressing a group called the 120 Committee at the North American Christian Convention in St. Louis. And when she stood there to talk to them, this is what she said. She said, I always said I'd rather hear Leon Apple preach than any other man. I knew any other man that I knew because I was sure that he lived what he preached at home. And I wasn't sure about some of you guys. <laughs> That'd be a way to hit you, wouldn't it? Bob Russell, who happened to be there for that committee meeting, said every preacher there sat there thinking to themselves, boy, I sure wish my wife felt that way about me. In one national survey, 400 men were given a choice, and neither choice was a good choice. But 400 men were given a choice about going through two types of negative experiences. If they were forced to go through one of them, which one would they prefer to endure? Now, let me share with you what those two choices were. First of all, was to be left alone and unloved in the world. The second one was to feel inadequate and disrespected by everyone. Did you know that 74% of the men who answered that question said if they were forced to choose, they would prefer to be alone and unloved in the world. And the reason for that is because their greater need was for respect. They did not want to go through that feeling inadequate and disrespected by everyone else. Those men weren't saying they didn't need love, but they did need to feel that respect even more. And by the same token, men, we are called to love our wives and rejoice in them. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18 tells us, Rejoice in the wife of your youth. May you ever be captivated by her love. You know, that word captivated in the Hebrew right here gives us the idea of always willingly intoxicated by her love. You look at her, and you're glad you're captured by her appearance and by her character. And when a wife knows that you rejoice in her, that you're captivated by her love, she will flourish inside. How do you express that love? One way to express that love is by expressing gratitude towards each other. Uh, there was a survey that was done by the University of Georgia, and a, and a new study was published in the Journal of Personal Relationships. They said after interviewing 468 married individuals on relationship satisfaction, they found that the most consistent, significant predictor of happy marriages was whether one's spouse expressed gratitude. They said, feeling appreciated and believing that your spouse values you directly influences how you feel about your marriage, how committed you are to it, and your belief that it will last. When love and respect are there for your marriage, gratitude towards each other will often be the result. The scriptures have always been right all along, haven't they? Fourth, your marriage will teach you spiritual lessons. Your marriage will teach you spiritual lessons. God designed marriage to be like this crucible where, where, you know, you are both in this thing and you're both getting things injected into your life, getting things cut out of your life and things added to your life right here. And they can develop, this crucible can develop tolerance in your life. And, and it can develop patience in your life and forgiveness and sacrifice and humility and unselfishness. In fact, those are the same kinds of feelings that Jesus has towards us. 
in your marriage, you can exhibit the fruits of the Spirit because of being with each other. The challenges that being with each other brings helps to develop those things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When you think about it, home is, is in reality is where reality comes into contact with your spiritual maturity. You can be pretty good here at church or at work or at the Rotary Club or Kiwanis Club or whatever, but home is where the guard is dropped and where the gold is either polished or tarnished. And it's a place where we learn to display uh, lessons of Scripture. Some years ago, a dispute arose in Britain between the Foreign Office and the Treasury Office, and they were arguing about uh, Rolls-Royce cars, which British ambassadors should be able to have a Rolls-Royce car in the country they were stationed in. Now, it's, it's no, no surprise that the Treasury wanted these very special cars to be restricted to a few places, like, for example, like Washington or, or Paris or even Moscow. The Foreign Office argued for many, uh, many more places to place a Rolls-Royce. They reasoned like this. They said, most people in a foreign capital have never been to Britain. They said, but, but when they see this magnificent car gliding through their streets with the United Kingdom flag on the hood, they'll say to themselves, I've not been to Britain, I don't know much about Britain, but if they make cars like that there, then Britain must be a wonderful place. In the same way, a Christian marriage can be an example and something which spurs on those who look at it and say, wow, that's pretty special. Let me tell you what those who are secular might think if they look at a successful Christian marriage. They might say, I have never seen God. Sometimes I wonder when I look at the world if God is good or if there even is a God. But if he can make a man and a woman love one another like this, if he can make this husband show costly faithfulness through sickness as well as health, if he can give, if he can give him resources to love his wife with Christ-like sacrifice, well, then he must be a good God. And if Christ can give his wife grace to submit so beautifully with such an attractive spirit, then again, he must be a good God. There are spiritual lessons that are there for us. We just have to watch for them and apply them to our marriage. And then the last one is your sexual relationship must be kept sacred. Your sexual relationship must be kept sacred. Someone called sex God's wedding gift to us. Max Lucado says, God desires to make you one with your spouse, and sex is one of his tools. Don't overrate it like society does. Don't ignore it like religion has done. Just appreciate it. It's great advice. Ray Ortland described it this way. He said, sex is like a fire. In the fireplace, it keeps us warm. Outside the fireplace, it burns the house down. Here's the message of the Bible. Keep the fire within the marital fireplace and stoke that fire as hot as you can. See, God tells us in his word that sexual intimacy unites two people in a one flesh relationship where a permanent bond is created. But it is more than two bodies uniting. It is life uniting as well. And, and, and in that context, sex is a wonderful, beautiful expression of intimacy and vulnerability that should be celebrated. Uh, it, 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 all the masks are taken off and there's no fear of rejection, no fear of abandonment. No fear of wondering, will they call me back tomorrow? Did you ever notice how important communication is when the scriptures talk about sex? You know, Solomon wrote the book, The Song of Solomon. And in that, uh, he kind of journals this series of conversations and actions by a, a married couple, a young married couple who are deeply in love. And in that, he, he talks about how their words express erotic thoughts and feelings towards each other. They're complimenting each other about beauty and being handsome. And there are expressions of appreciation for each other's bodies, and there's playful language that expresses how important communication is between the two. Now, that's so important that we pick up on that, that we recognize that God is the author of sex, that God has given it to us as a great gift within the confines of marriage. Now, how might we be tempted to make it less than sacred? by looking at pornography, by steamy novels and movies, by flirting with somebody else or having this emotional affair? Here's a question. Here's a question. Are you meeting each other's needs at home? Has sex become a chore or at least low on the list of priorities in your household? If we aren't careful, Satan can use our busyness 
our distractedness, our lack of quality time together to squash our sexual relationship. And that's the time we may be tempted to let the fire get out of the fireplace. The Apostle Paul addresses it in 1 Corinthians number, uh, chapter 7 by saying, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Married couples, sex, sexual intimacy ought to be a priority in our marriages. Dave Stone, who used to preach at the Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky, was telling one time about how he and his wife had gone to a, a couple's Bible study. And, and he said, one week while we were there, one of the gals said, you know, when my husband uh, gets the children their baths and puts them to bed without me asking him to do it, I find myself very attracted to him that night. And Dave said, I think that week every guy went home was constantly giving their little kid a bath. He said, that kid was probably saying, I already got a bath. And dad's saying, I don't care, get in there again anyway. <laughs> the world has gotten the sexual relationship wrong for a long time, hasn't it? Its view of sex is getting. But God's view of the sexual relationship is about giving wholeheartedly to the person that you'll spend the rest of your life with in a marriage relationship. You know, God's desire for our marriages is to be ha happy, and to be healthy. And I hope that these building blocks today have been uh, encouraging to you and helpful to you for your own marriage as well. Now next week we'll be talking about singles, so don't feel left out if you're, if you're single. But you know what? As much as these building blocks are important in a relationship, God has one more thing that's even more important for a married couple to do. And that is for each person in that couple to be a follower of Jesus Christ and to allow Him to be the Lord over your relationship. Today, maybe you are here and you say, you know what, I, I need to let him be the Lord of my life. I need to place him at the top. I need to put him on the throne of my life. If that's the case, then I would love to talk with you about how to do that, what the scriptures say. We're going to have an invitation song here in just a second, and if you'd like to come up and talk with me about that, I'll be right up here in the front and be glad to talk with you about that. And if you're a married couple that says, you know what, we need to put the Lord first in our life, and you'd like for me to pray with you, I'm happy to do that as well. Let's stand together. Let's sing this song, and if you have a decision to make, please join me up here in the front.